Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming uh, today. Uh, my name is Park Byung Jung. I am a senior research fellow at the CRAE. I will be your host for this session. Firstly, the CRAE president, Kim Hong Sang, will give welcome remarks. He is the organizer of this symposium. Because of his other schedule, uh, he will give remarks by his recorded video. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, welcome to our symposium. I am pleased to have you all in this international symposium for low carbon agriculture. The Korea Rural Economic Institute has prepared the events in cooperation with the Korea Environmental Economic Association, KEEA and the Asian Association of Environmental and Resource Economics, AAERE. Professor Arlen Matthews from Trinity College, Dr. Midori Aoyaki from the National Institute for Environmental Studies, and Dr. Shin Jung-do from the Korea Rural Development Administration. Thank you for being with us today. I also would like to express appreciation for the chairman and the experts participating in panel discussions. 127 nations around the world recently declared carbon neutrality to respond to climate change. In particular, European countries have sped up their shift to the green economy through Green Deal or Green New Deal targets. Following the trend, Korea suggested a long-term goal of carbon neutrality in July 2020. The Korean government proposed the Korean-style New Deal to achieve environmental friendly sustainability. The agriculture sector should be in a step toward the efforts for the green economy to complete carbon neutral obligations, overcome environmental challenges, and secure growth engines. For a successful shift to the green economies, agriculture needs reasonable reduction targets, technological development, and the policy program to achieve to target. With that goal in mind, KREI hosts this international symposium to seek ways to promote low carbon agriculture. I hope that prominent experts around the globe will share opinions through presentation and discussion for greenhouse gas reduction idea and carbon neutral policy. I expect that the symposium will be a venue for international and Korean experts to share ideas and information through open dialogues and seek ways to promote low carbon agriculture. I sincerely ask for your energetic participation in the event to develop ideas for the effective execution of low carbon agriculture. Thank you for listening. I wish you health and happiness always. Thank you. Thank you very much for that warm welcome remark. Uh, we will be listening uh, to presentations for over one hour uh, covering a range of uh, themes, including, including low carbon agriculture in an era of uh, carbon neutrality. This symposium uh, will be watched through YouTube channel. If you have any questions, please leave a message. I'm pretty honored to introduce today's speakers. 
our first speaker will be Dr. Shin Jung Do from Korea. Uh, he has worked as a research scientist in the National Academy of Agricultural Science since 2001. He has published more than 100 papers. He has recently studied on biomass conversion technology for carbon sequestration in respect of climate change. He will give one uh, presentation about uh, mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions and carbon sequestration for the agricultural sector in Korea. Thank you, introducing me, moderator, Dr. Chung. I'm so honored to stand here for my presentation in front of audience. My topic is mitigation of greenhouse gas emission and carbon sequestration for agriculture sector in Korea. Content of my presentation consists of four parts from background through mitigation technology of greenhouse gases and carbon sequestration using biochar in RDA. As reported in IPCC guideline, there are increases of 1.5 degree, 1.5% and 1.5 mm for temperature, changing rate of ecosystem and sea level, respectively for 15 years. There are agreement to global warm to increase 1.5 degree for 15 years on Paris Agreement 2015. IPCC Special Report and Long Term Low Carbon Development Strategy 2050. Let us see how they are going to calculate the greenhouse gas emission. As you see in the figure, there are crumland and riverstock part. Crumland consists of upland and paddy, including oxidation and reduction status. For example, organic matter are converted into nitrogen source. Based on nitrogen transformation, that occurred within 20 to 30 days after transplant. So, you got things about what you need to correct JG sample. I mean sampling animal. You have to set up sampling animal for one month very incentively after transplant. Animal waste from the livestock should be treated as a compost and a biogas production for mitigating GHG emission. Therefore, we need to make net greenhouse emission zero. Let us think about how come true. 28 of the 127 countries in the world Declared carbon neutral. Republic of Korea, European Union, Canada, Spain are in processing legalization for all industrial fields. For implementation of carbon neutral in agriculture sector and need to collect the accurate information on emission source and their amount in Korea. National GHG emission in Korea estimated at 727.6 million tons. However, agriculture is only 2.9% relative to the national GHG emission, especially 11.83 million tons for cramland, 8.6 million tons for livestock. Let me talking about mitigating strategic technology of GHG emission in Korea. Republic of Korea submitted to UN for its updated version of national target. 
to mitigate GHG emission on December 2020. With the target for mitigating GHG emission, there will be 0.3 million ton and 0.6 million ton with the practice of water management in crop product cultivation. The cycle of livestock manure and energy saving technology. For achieving long term low carbon strategy, their plans are including extending smart farm, low carbon agriculture technology as shallow irrigation, friendly environmental energy that hit that as a heat pump using underground heat and participation of pharmacy for consumer as a reduction of food waste. Additionally, long-term low carbon strategy on 2050 are currently in modifying due to low efficiency of practical application and mitigation on site. Let me talking about mitigating strategy of GHG emission in Korea. Dr. Kim in our department was invented the shallow irrigation system in ice paddy for mitigating of GHG emission for agriculture practice. For development of country-specific emission factor in agriculture and livestock parts, we are registered 10 for agriculture, 10 for livestock, 2 for energy. We are in the middle of the trigger 2 and 3 step for estimating estimation of GHG emission in Korea. We are planning on mitigation of GHG emission for crumb land. 17 research projects work on 11 in rice paddy, 6 in upland. Voluntarily mitigating technology applied with 6 research projects such as reducing the use of nitrogen fertilizer and cultivation method. Mitigation Mitigation plan of GHG emission for livestock are processing low carbon livestock management system, development of low methane feed, and breeding the qualifying forage, and so on. Mitigating plan of GHG emission for agriculture engineering will be included with renewable energy and energy self-reliance village. For achieving energy self-reliance village, the policy set up supporting farmers for practicing low carbon farming methods as well as changing the payment methods as a selective payment for low carbon. From now on, let us see how about biochar research for agricultural practice. I got published an article which was Influence of Activated Biochar Pellet Fertilizer Application on Greenhouse Gas Emission and Carbon Sequestration, which is impact factor is 7.0. Let us think about emerging carbon sequestration technology with biochar. You need to know what is biochar. The definition of the biochar is defined that a charcoal-like material produced by thermochemical finances or liquefaction technology or biomass. What function is there? 
So carbon sequestration for climate change as well as soil amendment. Then, absorption of ammonium nitrogen, hydrogen sulfur, and heavy metal as well as mitigation of greenhouse gases. Then, who is the work of mitigation for greenhouse gas emission and carbon sequestration in agricultural practice? Definite farmer, right? What kind of factor to be considered for farmers benefit? Need to consider about crop growth response, especially crop yield. Then, reducing application amount of fertilizer and its working time. And also you need to consider about how to apply the biota in the agricultural field and so on. In respect to describe the biochar mechanism, chemical structure of biochar has an aromatic name with a double carbon bond containing magnesium oxide. In Kyoto meeting of the IPCC in 2019, biochar application is climate approved for innovative technology for carbon sequestration and mitigation of GH emission. When you apply with biochar in cropland, you need to estimate the carbon sequestration based on equation 4AP.1. As you see in the figure 4 diagram of the biochar pellet production, first, Mix the biochar with the pig manure compost. Then add tether with the spray for different nutrient solution. Feed the mixture into filament mill and then produce the supplemented biochar manure fillet. As you see, Sangnim built a biochar pellet fertilizer system after patent transport. Approximately cost could be ten million dollars. Also, for estimation of carbon sequestration and its profit analysis, application of supplemented activated biochar pellet fertilizer was 1.23 ton per hectare and 4.49 ton per hectare for carbon sequestration and mitigation of CO2 equivalents during the rice cultivation. Furthermore, rice in yield in the treatment did not differ from that control. For cooperation research with RD and NUVO, the pattern issued on the granular type of the biochar slow release fertilizer. The research result indicated that 10% mixture of biochar can be more yield of cabbage than the, than the control, as you see in the figure. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Shin Jung-do, PhD. Uh, as an uh, expert on uh, biochar, uh, he uh, released, released very uh, clearly about the results of biochar uh, uh, test and uh, experiment. Uh, thank you very much for that very excellent uh, presentation. Uh, our second speaker for this session is me. Uh, let me introduce myself again. Uh, I work as a senior research fellow for Cray. Uh, my presentation is about uh, policies to promote low carbon agriculture. Good afternoon. My name is Hak Jung Jung. Uh, I will uh, give a presentation on uh, policies to promote low carbon agriculture. Uh, I'm so happy to give a presentation about uh, low carbon agriculture in an era of carbon neutrality. And I am also glad to communicate with overseas 
experts uh, related to greenhouse gas reduction. The content of my presentation are as follows. One my introduction to greenhouse gas reduction policy in agriculture, uh, three promotion policies, four conclusion. Reduction of greenhouse gases in agriculture is essential according to the Declaration of Carbon Neutrality. Efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions for climate change mitigation must be made globally and in all industries, and no exception is in agriculture. It is expected to strengthen obligations to, redu to reduce greenhouse gas emissions according to the Declaration of Carbon Neutrality. Greenhouse gas reduction technology is being researched and developed, but it is rarely applied. Figure 2 shows reduction goal achievement by means in 2019. Only 64.3% of the 2019 agricultural greenhouse gas reduction goal is achieved. There is a poor performance in the energy resource conservation conversion of livestock manure and circulation type water film. Low carbon agriculture is critical to achieving the national carbon neutral goal. So research is needed to analyze domestic and foreign methods and policies related to carbon reduction in the agricultural sector and to discover agricultural GHG reduction uh, projects and uh, system improvement uh, measures necessary for the 2050 carbon neutrality. Uh, let's move on to Chapter 2, GHG reduction policy in agriculture. Table 1 shows policies related to 2030 reduction technology. Uh, there, is, uh, uh, there are uh, three kinds of uh, uh, type in agriculture uh, related to greenhouse gas reduction, uh, rice farm, uh, livestock, and energy. Rice farm uh, has uh, two kinds of uh, uh, technologies. Uh, one is a simple irrigation of rice paddy, the other is a shallow water filling of rice paddy, and these technologies are related to policies uh, like this voluntary reduction projects, low carbon agricultural and livestock uh, certification. Uh, like this type of uh, reduction technologies and related uh, policies uh, can be uh, matched. Uh, there are two kinds of uh, farmer support programs. One is uh, financial support for facility installation uh, the other is uh, support farm uh, for low carbon agriculture. Figure three support for uh, figure three shows support for facility installation. Uh, the trend of these uh, programs uh, like this, uh, roughage and uh, resource recycling uh, program uh, are stable uh, uh, recently. But the trend of energy efficiency are sharply decreasing. And the support policy for low carbon uh, agriculture uh, has uh, three kinds uh, voluntary greenhouse gas reduction projects, a certificate of low carbon agricultural products, and external projects for emission trading uh, system. Figure 4 shows voluntary reduction projects. The reduction uh, is uh, decreasing and the farms uh, slightly increasing uh, recently. And the amount of reduction uh, is uh, small, uh, about 10,000 ton in 2020. Figure 5 shows certification system. Uh, farms and the reduction are uh, uh, increase, increasing together, but the amount of uh, reduction uh, is uh, uh, very small, uh, 80,000 ton in 2020. 
uh, we can uh, find uh, some limitations of these uh, policies. Uh, support for livestock manure recycling facilities uh, has uh, uh, some limitations like this. Uh, initial facility investment and high cost, non-use of compost fertilizer in farm, uh, increase in operating cost, and frequent complement, complaint, complaints due to the NIMBY facility. Figure 6 shows improvement required for facility support. For expansion of a project, self-payment, incentive, offset uh, system, uh, complaint resolution are needed. Voluntary reduction projects, project and emission trading system uh, have also uh, some limitations like this, a high initial investment cost, uh, difficulty of technology application, uh, and the difficulty of MRV and so on. Figure 7 uh, also shows improvement required for low-carbon agriculture support. For expansion of performance, a mutual complement, priority, and uh, uh, system uh, improvement uh, and awareness raising are needed. Okay, let's move on to uh, chapter 3, promotion policy. Uh, we can uh, propose uh, some basic directions uh, like this. Uh, selection of uh, reduction measures according to priorities and expansion of uh, distribution. Step-by-step uh, -step approach, economic incentives and market utilization, uh, and uh, forming a consensus on GHG reduction in the agricultural sector. Uh, we can propose uh, uh, this uh, uh, prioritization and implementation of uh, uh, reduction measures uh, as a core task. Uh, there are uh, some uh, instruments in the field farming in non-energy uh, sector, eco-friendly agricultural materials, uh, reduction of fertilization, uh, salacious soil conditioner, biochar, uh, reduction of water use for rice farm, and so on. But we must consider the cost effectiveness of these uh, uh, technologies. And we can also consider direct payments. Uh, our farmers do not want to accept uh, those technologies because of uh, high cost and labor. So uh, our, our government uh, must uh, uh, consider uh, providing incentive payment. The range of unit price can be calculated as follows. Uh, at first, the minimum unit price can be uh, calculated additional cost and the maximum unit price additional cost plus environmental benefits. Uh, we can find uh, overseas examples. Uh, EU rewards farms for reducing environmental and climate impact through eco scheme. Japan supports through direct subsidy for low carbon agriculture and the US expands the conserva conservation stewardship program to support environmental conservation activities. Uh, we must improve uh, facility support policy uh, to activate low carbon agriculture. Uh, we can set an example of a facility to convert livestock manure into resource. For supply, supply side, improvement of livestock excreta compost storage facilities, uh, strengthening of standard for infertility and heavy metals are needed. For demand side, the enforcement of labeling of raw materials and ingredients of compost fertilizer and the use of compost fertilizer as eco-friendly agricultural material uh, are also needed. Uh, expansion of infrastructure support and the facility maintenance is also uh, needed. Uh, we also uh, should improve low-carbon agriculture support policy. 
uh, we can set an example of a voluntary reduction project. After the first on-site verification through the voluntary greenhouse gas reduction project, the information can be used as the basis for external projects of the emission trading system or uh, certification of low-carbon agricultural uh, products. Demand development of new methodologies uh, and uh, business promotion, uh, education on low-carbon uh, low carbon farming methods are uh, also needed. Uh, we also consider technology development, uh, but uh, about this technology development, presenter Shin jung already released, uh, so I want to skip this page. Uh, we can also consider uh, education, promotion, and informatization as core tasks. Uh, especially, I would like to focus on uh, informatization. Uh, establishment of integrated data uh, management platform related to climate change uh, response in the domestic agricultural sector is uh, uh, very essential. Providing comprehensive information on adaptation to climate change and greenhouse gas uh, uh, reduction in order to avoid data uh, duplication uh, data scattered across the rural development administration, uh, provincial agricultural research and extension services, and the universities are integrated. Support for agricultural climate big data analysis research, uh, derivation of synergistic effects of GHG reduction policies among related organizations. So it is very, very important uh, for us to establish the integrated data management platform, platform. and review of energy demand supply, uh, support policy and the use of green uh, finance uh, can be considered as uh, core tasks. Okay, let's move on to uh, chapter uh, 4, conclusion. As I told you, with the declaration of the carbon uh, neutral goal for 2050, the obligation to reduce agricultural GHG is expected to be significantly strengthened. Although RDA is currently researching and developing technologies, but the facility installation support project has a uh, high initial facility investment cost, and the technology, according to the low-carbon agriculture uh, support policy, has limitations in adapt uh, adaptation. Uh, so, uh, I propose some uh, basic directions, uh, selecting reduction measures, uh, taking a step-by-step -step approach, and so on. Uh, selecting reduction priorities considering cost effectiveness is very important, and the uh, uh, direct payment system is also needed. It is required to revise the plan uh, so that farms can easily accept facility support and uh, low carbon agriculture support policies. Inventory and advancement and new technologies in energy non energy fields are essential. Uh, sharing information on the meaning and the impact of the carbon neutrality declaration needed to shift awareness, uh, providing, consider, uh, providing policy and technical information through publicity and education. Uh, these things is very important to uh, vitalize uh, low carbon agriculture uh, so that uh, our government uh, may obtain the target of greenhouse gas reduction in the future in the agricultural sector. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you. Uh, our third speaker for uh, this session uh, will be Dr. Midori Aiyoyagi from Japan. Uh, she studied rural sociology and agricultural policy at Kyoto University 
after graduation, she became a researcher at the National Institute for Environmental Studies. Uh, she now works as a principal researcher at the Institute. Her main field is uh, survey research on climate change policy and uh, energy issues. Uh, she will present about Japan's carbon neutral policies. Hello, this is Midori Aoyagi from National Institute for Environmental Studies, Japan. Today I talk about Japan's carbon neutral policies. And this is contents of my paper. It consists of the six chapters. The first introduction, then moves to the climate change policy mitigation and policy adaptation, then moves to the background to the past and the Paris Agreement and the policy responses in Japanese government and the responses in agriculture, forestry, and the fishery uh, sector, then conclude my uh, In this presentation, I will focus on the three chapters, and the fourth chapter, the Paris Agreement, and the fifth, uh, policy responses in Japanese government, and the sixth, responses in the agriculture sector. This slide shows the Paris Agreement and the policy responses by the Japanese government. As you know, Paris target was agreed in 2015 so that the Japanese government submitted a mid-term target that is 26% reduction compared to the 2013 level. And later, 2019, Japanese government submitted long-term target, that is 80% deduction compared to the 2013 level. The, as the Paris target asks every country to submit their new reduction target every five years, so that the, in 2020, Japanese government submitted mid-term target again but same numbers, 26% reduction compared to the 2013 level. After that, um, new Prime Minister Suga declared that we have to revise our long-term target, that is zero emission in 2050. So that we are now discussing about the net zero emission strategic plan for that long term target. So we are now working on the revision of the law concerning the promotion of measures to cope with global warming. And also we are now working at the um, in energy policy sector so that we are now planning to amend the basic energy plan, that is the sixth plan for adopting a new Paris target. And uh, that plan propose new energy mix for 2030 and 2050. And also in other sectors such as a Ministry of the Agriculture, Forestry and the Fishery, they are also talking about the um, carbon reduction from the that sector. They published the Green Food System Strategy in this April. The aim of that strategy is twofold. The first is to achieve both productivity improvement and sustainability of food, agriculture, forestry, and fisheries through innovation so that the government will formulate and vigorously promote the green food system strategy as a strategic policy from a medium to long term perspective. And the second is that based on this strategy, the entire supply chain, including procurement, production, processing, and the distribution and the consumption, will be promoted in terms of labor saving and the productivity improvement maximum utilization of local resources, decarbonization, that means prevention of global warming, and reduction of chemical pesticides and fertilizers, and the conservation 
and the regeneration of biodiversity. That um, strategy, GFSS, response, response to the, um, the European the Farm to Fork strategy that was published last year, and the United States, the Agricultural Innovation Agenda that is also published last year, those strategies or agendas, they are emphasized on the reduction of um, pesticides, and encourage the organic farming. So that this GFSS also emphasizes the reduction of chemical use and risks and the expansion of organic farming. And Japan aims to reduce the use of chemical pesticide by 50% in terms of the risk. And similarly, it aims to reduce the use of chemical fertilizers from imported raw materials and the fossil fuels by 30% and increase the proportion of arrival land and um, organic farming to 25%. That means 1 million hectares. In this presentation, I compare Japanese GFSS with European ones and the European Green Deal Fit 455 that is published last month by the EU. The, the, this uh, FIT455 package, the points are as follows. The first is the 2030 target and the 2050 carbon neutrality. And the second is the a clear vision of the society we want. And the third is the, the role of agriculture, forestry and fisheries as an energy supply sector. The fourth is the policy on technology development. And the last, fifth, quantitative evaluation of output. I discuss those points from now on in this presentation. Okay, the first is the 2030 target and 2050 carbon neutrality. Japanese GFSS, it doesn't have any 2030 target in their plan. Um, FIT 455 package declares to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 55% from 1990 levels by 2030 and achieve carbon net neutrality by 2050. But Japan's GFSS, on the other hand, only targets carbon neutrality in 2050 and makes no mention of 2030 reduction target. And EU plan strategy setting a 2030 reduction target that serves as a transit point to carbon neutrality in 2050. If the 2030 target is set more stringently, the world can achieve carbon neutrality more quickly. As a result, the negative impact of climate change will be reduced to, the ex to that extent. This is the cost of acting easier quickly compared to the cost of not acting, which IPCC report, which was uh, released in this month, is clearly said. Okay, my second discussion point, a uh, clear vision of the society we want. But in Japanese GFSS, there is no clear vision for the society we want. The achievement of the above objectives, I mean uh, long-term target 2050 neutrality, carbon neutrality, neutrality, will require a structural transformation of society. FIT 455, which is EU's um, strategic package, that it declares that the strengthening the EU's competitiveness, create the jobs of tomorrow, eradicate poverty and absorb the negative impacts of a structural transformation, including its cost. And it also declares on climate change, it clarifies that the cost of acting now is far less than, far less than the cost of not acting and it advocates 
international and international solidarity. Japanese GFSS, on the other hand, it had it doesn't expl explicitly discuss structural change. However, the agricultural, forestry, and fishery sector have continuously faced structural structural changes in the industry for several decades. In the future, how to respond to the enhancement of the new renewable energy sector, which is att attracting attention for its carbon neutrality, will be a challenge to deal with the cost soft landing of the social structure. So we must discuss about the society we want in the future, somewhere in the future. The third point is about energy. Japan's green food system strategy has less mentioned about the uh, energy supply as a sector. And but according to the IEA report which was published last year, agriculture, fishery and forestry sector accounted for seventy percent of the world's renewable energy production in twenty seventeen and the many renewable energy sources such as biodiesel are already in practice worldwide and widespread in Japan as well. But it doesn't pay much attention to bio-based energy, which is already in practice use and widespread. Japan's green food system that is very weak about the strategic point of view. It presents a timetable with a list of targets for innovation. It contents of each item in the list seems to be insufficiently examined. For example, at the top of the list is construction of energy management system of, for local production for local consumption by means of form-based photovoltaic power generation, biomass and the small hydroelectric power generation, which is to be researched and developed from 2020 to around 2030. Although those technologies are already in the dissemination stage in, in their world. Furthermore, when we look at the whole of the list, including this item above, the technology currently listed, listed are not the only ones that will be effective in 2050. There are many challenges to innovation, such as how to create new technologies in the future and the timetable for them. Innovation, innovative ideas can come from outside the existing field and the technologies used in other areas can significantly impact the current domain. It, uh, it often occurs in every field. In last point is a quantitative evaluation of output. There is no quantitative evaluation of output in this strategic plan. So that, the, in other words, it remains un, unclear how much reduction will be achieved by applying the listed technologies and how much they will contribute to the overall decrease or reduction in the country's uh, reduction target. And another aspect of the quantitative review that needs to further consideration is its role as a carbon sink. Even now, the lack of clarity in this assessment prevents the inclusion of a sink role in the plans of local authorities in Japan to deal. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Midori Ayoyagi. Uh, it's very impressive uh, the presentation compared the Japanese uh, green uh, food system with the EU Green Deal. Uh, so it's very impressive. Thank you so much. Our post speaker for this session uh, will be Professor Mat Alan Matthews from Ireland. He has been a professor uh, for European agricultural policy at Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland, uh, since 1997. He is now a professor uh, emeritus there. He worked for 
the European Association of Agricultural Economists as president and vice president. Uh, recently, uh, he has worked on climate change, common agricultural policy, and the Green Deal. Uh, he will be discussing about EU carbon neutral policies and its implication for agriculture. I'm very pleased to be able to share this uh, presentation on EU climate policies and their implications for agriculture with you uh, today. To set the scene, EU climate policy is built around three pillars. The emissions trading scheme, which is a cap and trade system covering uh, power installations and heavy industry. Then there's the effort sharing regulation, which uh, where agriculture uh, is covered along with road transport, buildings, waste and, and small industry. Here, the EU sets an aggregate uh, reduction target for each member state. Uh, so there's no specific EU target for agriculture. And it's up to member states to design the pathways uh, to reach their, their national targets. The third pillar is the land use, land use change in forestry, the Lulu CF sector. Uh, the EU and member states had commitments under the Kyoto Protocol uh, for this sector up to 2020, but it was not part of EU uh, climate policy until uh, the beginning of this year. Here I show you trends in the um, uh, uh, agriculture and uh, land use emissions. Agricultural emissions are the blue line. Uh, you can see that there was a reduction of around 20% in the first half of the period, uh, but since then uh, there has been no further progress. And indeed projections show that uh, very limited uh, further reductions in emissions are expected without additional measures. The orange line shows the Lulu CF sector, which is a sink uh, in the European Union. But you can see that in recent years, this sink has been reducing and this is projected to continue to 2030, uh, again in the absence of additional measures. EU climate policy is set in the context of what we call the European Green Deal. Uh, this is the flagship growth strategy of the incoming European Commission announced in December 2019 uh, with the intention that the EU should become a climate neutral continent by 2050 uh, with accompanying commitments to zero pollution, decoupling economic growth from resource use, building a circular economy and protecting and enhancing natural capital. And the European climate law, which was adopted in June of this year, enshrines the goal of zero net emissions by 2050 into law. And it also raised the ambition of the 2030 target to net 55% reduction in emissions compared to 1990. Just last month, the Commission published its Fit for 55 package, a comprehensive suite of legislation to update its climate architecture to meet these more ambitious targets. This slide shows how the EU has increased its climate ambition over time. So the first row shows the 2020 targets, uh, where the overall target of a reduction in 20% uh, relative to 1990 has been achieved. Uh, the next row shows the original 2030 targets, uh, and the final row shows the 2030 targets uh, as they are, have been revised and are now included in the European climate law. I want to highlight in particular the last column which shows the uh, ambition for the Lulu CF sector. As I've said, up to 2020, this sector was not included in EU climate policy. In the original 2030 targets, uh, it had a target whereby any emissions from the sector should be offset by removal, so a no debit target. Uh, but this was based on accounting rules uh, reflecting uh, the legacy of the Kyoto Protocol uh, and not the uh, inventory numbers as reported uh, to the UNFCCC. In the revised 2030 targets, uh, the removals target for the LULUCF uh, sector has been increased, uh, so it has been strengthened. And in addition, uh, this will now be based on the reported uh, accounts to the UNFCCC and the Kyoto Protocol accounting rules will be eliminated as and from uh, 2026. 
Farmers and landowners can take mitigation actions that are reflected either in the agricultural accounts in the uh, inventories or in the LULUCF accounts. So agriculture is largely about uh, methane and nitrous oxide emissions. Uh, the LULUCF sector is about emissions and removals of carbon dioxide. In agriculture, emissions are a function of both activity levels and emissions factors. And one can reduce emissions either by reducing, reducing emissions intensity. So for example, through productivity improvements or through the adoption of new technologies or by reducing activity levels. For example, uh, nitrogen use or the number of uh, ruminant animals. In the LULUCF sector, uh, actions can either try to uh, reduce uh, the emissions of CO2, for example, by uh, preventing the conversion of grassland to arable land or by stopping the harvesting of peat, or they can try to uh, uh, increase removals uh, through carbon uh, sequestration, for example, through uh, re-wetting organic soils or by converting arable land uh, to grassland or through afforestation. In Europe, these actions can be supported through the EU's common agricultural policy, what we call the CAP. The CAP has been in existence since the early 60s. It has been reformed on several occasions, and most recently in the summer of this year, uh, when these changes will take effect from the 1st of January uh, 2023. The CAP is divided into two pillars. Uh, pillar one uh, finances mainly direct payments to farmers and uh, some little uh, market management activity, while pillar two finances rural development programs and measures. From the point of view of climate action, what is important is what we call the green architecture of the CAP. And this consists of three elements, which I've marked here in the light green. So in pillar one, all farmers in receipt of basic payments or direct payments must observe a set of conditions, what we call good agricultural and environmental conditions. For example, grassland farmers must maintain the area of permanent grassland and are forbidden to plough grassland in areas of high nature value. Arable farmers uh, must observe a crop rotation, uh, uh, are not allowed to burn arable stubble, they, that must be returned to the soil, and are required to uh, set aside areas of their farm uh, for nature and for biodiversity. These conditions have been uh, there in the CAP for quite some time, but in the most recent reform they have been strengthened, and, and so we refer to this as enhanced conditionality. Another innovation in the recent reform has been the introduction of eco schemes. So uh, at least one quarter, 25% of the uh, funding for direct payments must now be allocated uh, to compensate farmers for practices that are friendly to the environment and to climate action. Such practices have been uh, uh, funded in pillar two of the CAP uh, through what we call agri-environment climate schemes for quite some time. So these are voluntary schemes and if farmers enroll in them, they can be compensated uh, for the costs incurred or the income forgone as a result of following the recommended practices. So the intention is that uh, these measures can now also be supported uh, through pillar one uh, of the cap. There are some minor differences. Uh, the compensation mechanism for eco schemes is a little bit more flexible than it is for agri environment uh, climate schemes in pillar two, but essentially uh, they will fund the same types of measures. However, to date, as we've seen, uh, the results of climate action in the CAP have been, uh, have been very modest. Uh, and this is for a number of reasons. Uh, mitigation actions impose extra costs on farmers. So unless they are incentivized either by regulation or by the payment of subsidies, uh, it's unlikely they will take sufficient action uh, to make a significant difference. In Europe, there are fears of emissions leakage, uh, which refers to the fact that if mitigation actions lead to a reduction in production or activity, and in the absence of any change in consumption, uh, then production will simply shift uh, to countries outside the European Union. Often uh, these countries are less uh, efficient in production, they have higher emissions intensities of production, and there is at least the possibility that 
global emissions could increase, even if emissions within the European Union are reduced. We've seen that there has uh, been the absence of specific agricultural emissions reduction targets. So this has allowed member states uh, not to prioritize uh, agricultural emissions reduction, but to put their efforts into reducing emissions, uh, for example, in the buildings or transport uh, sector in order to meet uh, their national targets. And similarly, the LULUCF rules similarly have not incentivized land sink uh, action. But apart from these policy barriers, it's important also to point out uh, the technical issues. Uh, getting credit for mitigation actions in agriculture in the national inventories uh, is not straightforward. Uh, agricultural and land emissions uh, essentially arise because of biological activity. Uh, and it requires a huge amount of data on uh, the management practices on farms in order to capture uh, emissions reductions uh, in a credible uh, manner. Uh, so this is an issue which, uh, which also needs to be addressed. However, we've seen that in the new cap uh, to come into effect from 2023, there is a greater emphasis on climate action. And the Commission has suggested a range of schemes uh, that member states could use to support uh, farmers uh, in this effort. I want to highlight in particular the last uh, scheme mentioned on this slide, which is carbon uh, farming. So, the European Green Deal is an economy-wide strategy, but it has been interpreted for the agricultural and food sectors in a separate communication, which we call uh, the Farm to Fork strategy. And specifically on climate uh, action, the Farm to Fork strategy sets forward uh, two uh, initiatives. One is a carbon farming initiative, which would provide uh, financial incentives to farmers and foresters. And in addition, the Commission uh, proposes to de develop a regulatory framework uh, to certify these carbon removals. So they could be, uh, for example, traded or uh, be integrated into uh, the national inventories. But I would warn that uh, this type of carbon farming uh, is, is, is not without problems. And there are many practical issues that remain to be uh, resolved, which I've listed here. Questions of monitoring, of verification, ensuring additionality, uh, avoiding reversibility, uh, dealing with satiation, uh, the p potential high level of transactions costs when you have maybe hundreds of thousands of farms who uh, wish to participate in these schemes, uh, and of course ensuring accounting integrity so that you do not double count uh, uh, removals in the agricultural sector and also uh, th th these are counted in the sector uh, that has purchased uh, these uh, removals. We do have quite a number of pilot schemes now operating, which are using the voluntary carbon market, and hopefully these can help us to provide guidance to ensure uh, a credible and trustworthy uh, system of carbon farming uh, in the future. In addition uh, to supply side measures, uh, the impact assessment uh, undertaken by the Commission for the uh, more ambitious 2030 targets highlighted uh, the importance of reductions stemming from changing consumer choices towards healthier diets uh, and suggested these would be at least equally important to uh, as supply side measures in reaching uh, the targets. So this is primarily the result of a shift from animal source foods uh, to more plant-based uh, diets. And in the farm to fork strategy, there are various suggestions put forward as to uh, the types of interventions which could encourage consumers uh, to make this uh, dietary uh, shift. But most of these focus on information provision, uh, for example, the use of carbon labeling, and in my view, don't really seem up to the, uh, up to the task. Uh, the wild card here is, of course, uh, the future of alternative proteins. So either plant-based substitutes uh, for meat or uh, cellular meats, uh, which uh, may come uh, along uh, a little later. Uh, there's been a lot of hype uh, and a lot of publicity around these alternative proteins, uh, but the extent to which they will actually make a contribution uh, to emissions reduction in the period up to 2030 uh, remains unclear. So in conclusions, uh, I would argue that um, 
despite a lot of uh, rhetoric and uh, the inclusion of climate action as an important uh, objective uh, for uh, the common agricultural policy. Um, uh, the results of this action for uh, agriculture and, and the land sector have been disappointing to date. We've seen agricultural emissions have flatlined and that uh, LULUCF removals uh, are reducing and expected to reduce further uh, in the absence of additional uh, measures. However, uh, the recent reform of the cap, uh, which will come into a effect in 2023, will have a greater focus on uh, climate action and um, greater removals will be sought in the land sector. This is mainly an issue around forestry rather than agriculture. Um, but it, it, I would still highlight there is no EU-wide target for reduction in agricultural emissions, although many individual countries uh, have adopted national targets, uh, which may help to incentivize change. Importantly, uh, the Commission has floated the idea of a combined uh, a FOLU sector, uh, that is both agriculture and land use, sec uh, land use uh, uh, emissions together, and has suggested uh, a net zero target by 2035. Uh, so this would give a specific target uh, both for agriculture and, and land use uh, in the future. Uh, however, whether the measures in place are sufficient to reach that ambition, ambitious target remains open to, to question. And what I would highlight uh, in conclusion is that emissions reductions to date have been sought largely through voluntary measures. Measures. So uh, relevant practices uh, have been subsidized to encourage the uptake by farmers. Uh, what we haven't seen uh, is the application of the polluter pays principle. Uh, so, for example, the use of market based measures such as taxes or, or levies or a cap and trade system, such has been uh, proposed, for example, in uh, New Zealand. So if it is the case that uh, time shows that we are not achieving uh, the ambitious targets uh, with the measures that we now have in place, it clearly will become necessary to look at uh, these more aggressive and more ambitious measures uh, to ensure we reach the net zero target by 2050. So thank you for your attention and I look forward to any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you very much for uh, Professor Alla Matthews. Uh, uh, so we are interested in uh, uh, farm to fork uh, strategies and uh, CAP uh, after 2020, uh, uh, so, uh, these uh, uh, greenhouse gas reduction policies is very important in EU. Uh, and other countries. So uh, I, the presentation uh, uh, introduced to us very uh, well. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, now our uh, session's presentations uh, have ended. Uh, we will have a, a short break for a while uh, until 15.15 15, uh, p.m. in Korean time and 8.15 uh, in Danish time. So after 10 minutes, we will uh, start again.
The panel discussion will start soon. Uh, please take your seat. Okay, I am pretty honored to introduce today's moderator. Our moderator in panel discu discussion will be Dr. Kim Jong-in from Korea. He is a professor of the Department of Econom uh, Economics at Chungang University, Korea. He studied, studied environmental economics at the University of Minnesota in the USA. He was a former president of the Korean Environmental Economic Economics Association and the Northeast Asian Economic Association. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, it's my great honor to be a moderator in this very valuable seminar. And then uh, congratulations for your uh, AAERE 2021, which is the 10th uh, Congress of the Asian Association of environmental and resource economics. I really appreciate on behalf of the Environmental Economic Association and uh, the East Asian Economic Association. Uh, as you might know, that because of the COVID, you should know, uh, because of the COVID, uh, we are having a hybrid uh, seminar, which is offline and online today. Uh, I also thank you very much, Professor Matthew and Dr. Aoyagi, for the uh, valuable uh, presentation. And also, uh, I'm very thank you for the Dr. Shin Jong Du and Dr. Chong Ha Kyun, which they prevent carbon neutrality in Korea, especially for agricultural and forestry fishery sectors. Their presentation is also very good and very valuable. So we've learned quite a lot. We invite three uh, discussants today. First discussant is Dr. Kang Sang-in, uh, who is Chief Research Fellow in Korean Adaptation Center for Climate Change and Occasional Farm in, in Korea. And uh, he has also worked on uh, various areas, especially trade and environment, sustainable development, and climate resilience. The second uh, discussant is Dr. Lee Sang Min, who is now beside me, is uh, uh, working for the Forestry Policy Department in uh, KEEI. Cray. Sorry, excuse me. Sometimes my pronunciation and my eyesight is getting bad because of the COVID. I think you will probably understand it. Uh, the main research uh, fields are the forestry management and international trade of forestry product. He is member of Policy Evaluation Committee of Korea Forestry Service Agency. Our last discussant is Dr. Song Jae-hoon. He is a research fellow in Korea Rural Economic Institute, uh, and he graduated from uh, Department of Economics in Iowa State University in the United States of America. Uh, since 2016, he has worked in climate change and agricultural resource management. Okay, as you, thank you very much for all presenter and for all uh, discussant. Now. Uh, let me uh, connect to the Dr. Gang first for the comment or for the, some questions. Then, if there is uh, any kind of questions or comment, uh, if the Professor Matthew can answer, then please do so. And if the uh, Dr. Aoyagi, then also I will give you the mic. Sometimes I will give you the flow, but uh, there is no flow at this time. So this uh, visually, I'm going to give you the floor. All right. OK. Dr. Gang, uh, how are you? Nice to see you again through the Yep, uh, fine. Nice to see you yeah, again. You look so good. Yep, yep. in my home. <laughs> oh, OK. Owing to the COVID-19 pandemic. pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I'm a research I'm fellow, fellow and, and uh, at the moment, occasional farmer in my hometown, Tbilisi. 
So it's, it's my great pleasure to join this thematic session on low carbon uh, farming practice and policy in Korea, Japan, and European Union. And I'd like to appreciate much all the three uh, informative and critical introductions to that. And I could take from the presentations the following observation and recommendation. If possible, I'd like to share one a slide with you. Uh, that this one, can, can you see it? Yeah. Okay, okay. So uh, first, uh, it seems mitigation targeting is not a priority in agriculture in the developed countries and region. Uh, less than 1 million ton in Korea and DC 2030, and in Japan and EU, none or very limited reduction target in spite of green food system strategy and pit pot pit five aiming net zero 2050. I think this partly because of uh, agricultural emission is not substantial and has a limited mitigation potential, around three to four percent of national emission in Korea and Japan and interesting but piecemeal mitigation options with limited applicability at local specific conditions. So based on these observations, I think we need uh, a mind switching facing the current uh, climate emergency. We better go beyond uh, the low carbon farming practice with forestry carbon think at the moment. This means that we need to take more comprehensive an integrated approach based on problem solving innovation, which covers current uh, technological challenges. For example, uh, solar farming system for food and energy supply, not energy consumption in the agricultural sector. So if you take a look at the right hand side, this uh, uh, graphs in the top uh, shows the uh, photovoltaic power generation by different wavelengths and the materials. The lead dotted line shows that the uh, morphous silicon, crystallized silicon panel, use mostly the 800 and 1100 nanometers of uh, solar wavelengths. Uh, and uh, the food supply through the photosynthetic uh, process, it use between uh, 400 and 700 nanometers by the chronopyl B and chlorophyll A is dotted in the green dotted circle. So uh, this kind of very detailed uh, uh, technological and scientific uh, consideration could provide some very interesting innovative solutions integrated solar farming system mentioned in the presentation of the Dr. Aoyagi. And uh, I think uh, we need to invest more in the rural development and the smart agriculture, uh, englobing all of these uh, sustainable biochemical and electromagnetic metabolism of human livelihood and civilization already undergoing heavy climate change pressure. So these are my brief uh, observation and recommendation for the three presentations. And I'd like to thank you again, all the three presenters for the excellent introduction. Uh, uh, next to Discussant is Dr. Lee Sangmin, uh, the priest. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the timing and presentation and from the very distinguished scholars from EU and, and Japan. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, begin again. Thank you very much uh, for the very clear and the knowledgeable presentation from distinguished scholars from EU and Japan and Korea. Uh, as you have heard from um, introduction, introduction from Professor Kim, I'm actually working in the forestry and uh, occasionally I, I joined, joined the environmental, environmental project. So I have not much uh, experience, but as, as you have, but I, uh, a couple of years ago, I have a kind of a, a project leader in economic uh, environment project 
environmental economic project. So I, ha I will give uh, some uh, personal experience what I have learned from that research. Uh, according to the National uh, Greenhouse Gas Inventory Report, we have much more agricultural greenhouse emission from non-energy sector than energy sector. The fact that, this fact said that we need to put we need to put more effort on rice farm and livestock to reduce grand greenhouse gas emission. But as you have heard from Dr. Jung's presentation, many external projects for emission trading system are closely related to the energy sector. It says that there are limited reduced greenhouse gas from non-energy sector that can be traded in market. It is strongly required to develop external project for the non-energy sector. And uh, livestock manure, that is a very big, serious problem to Korean uh, greenhouse gas emission in agriculture sectors. It uh, consists of about over 8 million carbon dioxide equivalent tons per year. And uh, this is the biggest portion of all agricultural sectors. Transfer, transferring the manure into bioenergy is uh, changing greenhouse gas from non-energy sector into energy source. And this would be the way to reduce greenhouse gas emission from energy and the non-energy sector at the same time. So the biochar, which has been presented by Dr. Sin, is a very good idea to reduce the manure and uh, absorb the carbon from soil. And it is required to promote the certification system of low carbon agricultural products. Since this is market-based reduction system, there is no distortion on price. But the voluntary system usually does not have a uh, good refraction, effort refraction on the price. And the consumers are not willing to pay more money <coughs> on the reduction effort at the early stage of the, of the system. So some kind of incentives should be put for the voluntary works and voluntary efforts. And also there are several methods that are known to be effective in greenhouse gas reduction in rice farm and the livestock. But the results are not usually objective and clear and consistent. So we need a clear and objective uh, greenhouse gas reduction parameters based on the various experiments. This will lead the farmers to understand and to take the consequences of a reduction. Uh, the clear and consistent parameter will provide market information, such as the difference between price, carbon price, and the abatement, abatement cost. This will be a signal for the private investment if the difference is positive. And if the difference is negative, this will be uh, information for the government. This will be based for the financial assist assistance, such as direct payment. In 2011, UNEP suggests the law for the government as well as the private sector that will increase the effectiveness from both sectors' effort of transit transition to green economy. It said that the government should uh, reduce or abolish the subsidies and the reform policies and uh, provide new incentives to give competitiveness to green product. And to strengthen market infrastructure and market-based system, redirecting public investment and and greening public procurement. If we, we lawfully access the current status of Korean low carbon agriculture, according to the role of government, 
we may have a clear view what we need, we need to do for the future. Uh, the government tried to reduce the amount of subsidy and the trend it to direct payment in Korea right now. But the original purpose of the payment has changed and the payment looks like another type of subsidies. For the market structure, it says that there are limited trade emissions for greenhouse gas reduction from non-energy sector of agriculture, as I, I, I said previously. And uh, the agricultural ministry budget, which is uh, closely related to the climate change, uh, has uh, go up and down uh, from 2015 to 2019, such that 499 billion won in 2015, 517 billion won in 2016, 445 2017, 481 2018, and 480 2019. Mm -hmm. We also have, do not have many choices to reduce carbon produced from agriculture. Thus, we do not have many technology that we can rely. Various green technology will provide, provide a marginal payment cost, and uh, that will make a curve. And the low cost technology would apply in practice at first. The marginal cost curve will provide information about greenhouse gas information, greenhouse uh, uh, reduction amount, and the budget, the relationship between budget and the reductions. If a real yearly reduction amount is thus decided according to the timeline, we know how much money should be invested publicly. The economic development at the expense of excessive depletion and the degradation of natural resources has had the detrimental impacts on the sustainability of our society. Development of agriculture to increase productivity is harmful to natural resources as well as the climate. To, vo to avoid this kind of a destructive process, it is required to admit natural resources as part of production and endow with the value, just like other financial assets. This is the way to transit our society into green economy, and the agricultural production utilizes the natural resources directly. Giving value on nature is the starting point of transition into green economy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Uh, my third last discussant is uh, Dr. Song Jae-hoon from Cray. Okay. Dr. Song, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. I'm, I'm, OK. Can you hear me? Sure. Would you start? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, thank you for a good presentation. So, uh, yeah, I have four issues I want to discuss and share my idea. So, first, uh, first of all, uh, I want to discuss about extension services. Uh, to increase from the usage of mitigation measures, extension services are essential due to the uncertainty regarding mitigation measures. But uh, I think we I think, um, I think it would be better to pay more attention to establishing to, or improving a system of extension services, especially in Korea. So, so uh, if possible, I think it would be useful to discuss or share enabling factors and barriers for effective knowledge and technology transfer or technology transfer or dispersion. Uh, 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 this, um, this is this is issue is um, I think in Korea, especially especially in Korea, there is a lack of experience regarding extension services. So, if uh, Japan or uh, UK presenter, if you have any experience, uh, please 
share your experience or knowledge about extension service, how to how to make extension service more effectively or e efficiently. So second issue is monitoring and evaluation. Um, as open, as um, I think lack of the monitoring and evaluation system based on quantitative measure is one of the huge barriers in Korea, especially for the evidence-based policy making. In the case of policies for response to crime change, uh, the monitoring and evaluation is important to address the uncertainty of crime change and policy measures. So um, if possible, it would be useful to discuss share the status of existing m &E system in Korea or and UK and Japan for mitigation policies in agriculture, agriculture and what is the pros and cons of them. Um, the third issue is the, um, using Rulu CF. So as a case of EU, Rulu CF is the important sector for carbon neutrality. However, compared to EU, um, Korea seems to pay less attention to measures related to Rulu CF and carbon sequestration, so except for biochar. So I think it, it would be better to um, a specific policies related to Rulu CF or carbon circulation in Japan or UK and share the, share the experience and uh, share the experience. Uh, last is the uh, integrated approach to um, integrated approach for more effective mitigation. So it, it, this is kind of water and energy nexus. Mitigation measures should affect resource, agricultural resource use. For example, re-wetting peatlands and organic soils would increase water use. Also, energy saving pump would increase the water use by decreasing marginal cost of water use. So to prevent this unintended impact, the, the integrated approach between mitigation and resource use are essential. So if you, uh, so if you have any examples or experience or policies address, addressing this is on uh, addressing this unintended policy text. Please let me know or share or discuss them. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Matthew and uh, Dr. Aoyagi. And uh, can you answer some questions from the discussant? For example, the MRV issues and the integrated approach, such as nexus issue, like uh, usually we uh, we are talking about nexus as a uh, water food climate change or land use or even uh, the f of course the food yeah okay uh, professor matthew first would you answer something about All right. um <coughs> let me first thank, thank the uh, three discussants for the very uh, insightful uh, comments and let me just take a number of the issues that have been raised um, uh, Dr. Kang uh, uh, mentioned that a potential reason for the uh, neglect, perhaps that's too strong a word, but the lack of uh, um, emphasis on reducing agricultural emissions is partly because uh, it's a relatively small share of total emissions and also uh, mitigation potential is, is low. Um, I didn't give the figure for the European Union, uh, but it's around 10% uh, of total emissions uh, coming from the agricultural sector alone. Uh, as I say, the Lulu CF sector is a sink at the moment, but it is uh, rapidly declining in importance and actually will become a source uh, in the 2030s unless we actually take action uh, to try to uh, reverse that. Um, so, and in my own country, in Ireland, agricultural emissions are actually 35% of the total. So, uh, the relative importance does vary across uh, across countries. And uh, I do agree that the uh, availability of technical mitigation options uh, is more limited than we see in the uh, in the energy sector, uh, for example, uh, and. 
this raises uh, a, an issue which um, I think is is often not discussed enough, uh, which is to what extent are we going to see some reduction in agricultural production in order to meet these climate uh, change uh, targets? This reduction could come about uh, either uh, through demand changes, and I, I highlighted that this is certainly foreseen in the EU strategy, but I also uh, suggested that the the instruments uh, that are available to governments to try to influence dietary preferences and, and consumption patterns uh, seem to be very limited. Uh, so how successful we will be uh, to make these changes in demand um, uh, remains to be seen. Uh, one can, of course, also uh, try to, uh, to, to uh, reduce activity levels through supply side measures. And this is certainly part of the debate in Europe uh, around the farm to fork uh, strategy, because the measures that are included in that strategy, uh, some of them quite ambitious, uh, for example, to increase the area under organic farming from about 8% uh, currently in Europe to, to 25%. So a threefold increase in the area under organic farming by 2030. A reduction in um, uh, pesticide uh, use by 50%. So, uh, unless farmers have access to alternative uh, integrated pest management or biopesticides, you know that could also impact on yields and and production. Um, uh, and uh, we also then have the livestock issue and whether we should be moving towards more extensive. Uh, livestock systems. So um, uh, these are very much part of the debate in Europe, and it would be interesting to to hear uh, to what extent uh, governments also in Japan and, and Korea uh, are prepared to to think about uh, some reduction in 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 output in order to meet uh, climate change uh, targets. Um, uh, an important point made by Dr. Lee, I thought, was the emphasis on co-benefits. Uh, so, in other words, when we are uh, discussing climate policy, we should not uh, overlook the potential to create synergies with other uh, um, uh, uh, potential benefits. For example, improvements in air quality, improvements in water quality, and also uh, improvements in, uh, in biodiversity. Uh, so even though climate action on its own can sometimes seem to be uh, uh, very expensive, um, it it can, if we take into account, uh, as well as the reduction in greenhouse gases, uh, if we also take into account these, uh, these co-benefits, uh, then uh, it can often become uh, more attractive uh, for governments to pursue. So I think those of us who are advocating for climate action uh, should uh, emphasize uh, where it is uh, relevant, uh, the importance uh, of these co-benefits. And finally, uh, just uh, uh, I would like to, to uh, um, uh, very much support uh, Dr. Sung's point about the importance of extension uh, and advisory services. And indeed, in the European Union, Union, uh, uh, this is also uh, emphasized. Uh, and part of the uh, new uh, reform of the common agricultural policy, which I mentioned, uh, requires member states uh, to put in place uh, advisory services, uh, which can advise farmers not only on the traditional aspects of uh, farm production and, and, and farm business management, but can also advise them on uh, climate uh, mitigation actions. So that is going to require, first of all, uh, a big upgrading in the skills of uh, the advisors, uh, because you know this is a new area for them, and uh, uh, if they are to be uh, credible in 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 talking to farmers, of course they need to have uh, uh, adequate uh, uh, information and research uh, background and so on. Uh, but it's clear that um, uh, farmers need to understand 
why they are being asked to make these changes uh, to their practices. Um, and they also need to be uh, fully confident when they embark on, the, on these changes uh, that they uh, are going to work uh, for them. So uh, I, I, I do absolutely support uh, Dr. Sung's emphasis on extension. So uh, that would be my initial uh, set of reaction to, to, to really some great comments uh, from the discussions. Thank you very much. Professor Matthew, thank you very much, Professor Matthew. How about Dr. Aoyagi? You have something to say, probably. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for very various good comments. Um, I have to, to talk about something about this structure. We have a lot of problems that uh, one is that the aging and the average age of the farmers is nearly 70. I mean, 69.5 years old. So it's too old for them to do a new um, new um, practices. That is a big problem. And uh, not only the aging, but also the decreasing the farmer's population. That is another problem and decreasing the income. So that we have, I, as I said in my presentation, we have the a decades of the structural problems and it continues right now. And that is the main reason for Japanese government to do something new in that sector. And, uh, and also that the, the the carbon dioxide emissions from agricultural sector is less than 4%. That means that, the, for example, household sector emits more than 15%, nearly 20%. And the uh, industry sector, they emit more than 60%. So 4% is a very minor in Japanese government. That is another problem. That, that, that is another, another reason for Japanese government to pay less attention to this issue. So that is a situation of Japanese agriculture and forest and fishery sectors. And uh, although those situation, um, Ministry of Agriculture, they are trying to do uh, many things like uh, solar sharing or subsidizing the um, so for example, um, some several trials for um, eco farming and uh, um, biodiversity and the biomass energy enhancement, everything. But uh, the, those, those uh, achievement is very, very small because of that uh, small uh, subsidizing and very strong in production sector, I mean, uh, rice production and other vegetable se se sector and the uh, uh, other uh, sectors in production sector is very strong in Ministry of the Agriculture so that the um, environmental section in, um, in the ministry is very weak. That is so, mm, I would say, it. that's pity, okay. And another thing is that, uh, oh, yes, yes, extension services. We have extension services in agriculture in Japan, too. And uh, that is uh, um, prefectural level agriculture section is responsible for, responsible for extension services. But uh, the situation is the same as in EU, that the extension service sector people, they are also um, not familiar with climate change issues so that they have to learn by themselves about the climate change issues and uh, that application of the agriculture and uh, farm, uh, farming practices. That is a main uh, problem of uh, extension services, but uh, they are trying to do some uh, very good things. For example, one is achieving and uh, developing the um, databases all over Japan, they share the big databases about the, not only the climate change issues, but they have the um, every angle agricultural practices uh, um, databases so that, that they can use it for uh, extension of knowledge. Maybe um, they are challenging to add climate change practices on that databases, I think, I believe. Uh, 
I have interviewed one of the prefectural section, extension service sections, and they told me so. So maybe that is one um, being your home issues. Uh -huh. Okay. Mm. Okay, that is for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, as a moderator, I have one question for the Professor Matthew. In your presentation, I found demand side in the last uh, pages. I think demand side uh, measurement, which is very, very closely related to the consumer choice, I think the consumer behavior changing is also very, very important. So how do you think about this kind of a, a very effective way to change consumer behavior, especially in the food uh, like uh, supply chain kind of things? Because in that way, I think agricultural role is very, very important. And also, for example, organic food kind of things is also probably booming. So we have to change. Consumer have to change. That is my key point. So how, how does it go in Europe? It's a very hardball question, but I think we have to do it something you know, to achieve carbon neutrality or 2030 NDC kind of things. Whatever it means, we have to do something. I think that the first step is changing our habit, food habit. I want to hear from you. Well, sorry this about is the, a very yeah, difficult, sorry about the hard work question. Very difficult question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, it really has to do with uh, shifting away, not not eliminating, but certainly reducing our consumption of uh, animal source foods, so both meat and and dairy products, uh, within the European Union, uh, uh, probably about eighty percent of our total agricultural emissions uh, are coming from the livestock sector. Uh, if we also include in livestock uh, the production of animal feed. So I'm not just looking at the, uh, the emissions from the, the animals themselves, but also the uh, indirect emissions from uh, the fertilizer and the, um, uh, the animal feed uh, production. Uh, so that's really the, the, the big um, source of agricultural emissions is, is the animal source foods. So how to uh, encourage um, a reduction in the consumption? Of course, you have... Um, uh, particularly amongst young people, uh, you have uh, an increase in uh, the numbers who say that they are vegetarian, um, but it's still quite a very small minority, I would say. Um, so, of course, you have some um, uh, academic papers uh, which look at the the impact of, for example, uh, taxing uh, meat uh, and, and, and dairy products. Um, but even here, even if there is a political uh, consensus to do this, and, and this is extremely difficult, uh, where this issue has been raised, for example, in Germany, um, uh, one observes a very strong reaction uh, against this idea, saying that this is uh, an interference in, 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 in a, a con individual consumer choice, and, and this is not something which the government should be doing. Um, but even if we were to introduce it, the academic evidence suggests that the uh, demand response is very limited, um, unless you really impose very high taxes, which I think are not uh, going to be feasible. So for me, uh, this issue is really around the uh, the future availability of these so-called alternative uh, proteins. If indeed um, uh, we see uh, these products, for example, uh, oat milk, uh, soya, soya milk, um, uh, plant-based burgers, plant-based uh, sausages, if these can become um, competitive uh, uh, in the supermarkets, not only in terms of price, but also in terms of taste and, and texture, um, then just like there is an incentive for consumers to uh, 
uh, purchase electric vehicles once the cost comes down and they become competitive with uh, the internal combustion engine, then I think we could see uh, perhaps quite rapidly uh, shifts in consumer demand. But it will depend on the availability of these alternative plant-based uh, products at a, a, a competitive uh, at a competitive price. Uh, so that would be, I think, my response uh, to your very important question. Sir. Okay, how about the doctor? I argue there is any kind of trend for the changing the food habit in Japan, uh, especially the local food kind of things or any kind of uh, models or uh, types in Japan? Oh. Have less, less me than any other people in, in the world. So that I can uh, talk about the um, alternative meat, although um, several companies are now in in Japan to sell uh, alternate, alternative meat. But actually, uh, we have already soybean hamburger or something like that, so that we are very familiar with um, plant-based um, meat alternatives. And uh, Another thing I have to discuss here is that the, the, the role of innovation and uh, how to encourage climate, um, low emission um, innovations. I think that uh, um, today's presentation in, in Korean colleagues, they discussed a lot about the in technology and the, its innovation. But uh, I don't think any strategies for developing the uh, low carbon um, technologies or how to invest in those innovations. I think that uh, we have 30 years from now to 2050, we have 30 years. That's enough years for invest a lot of innovations or technologies and we need strategies, concrete strategies for that. And uh, strategies usually come from outside our field, not only the agricultural sector, but also other sectors. For example, food sector. We, are, we discussed about the alternative meat, but the, the, those movement came from other sectors, food sectors. How do, you, how do we treat those kind of innovations occurred in other sectors? And uh, also in Japan, um, many consumer habits have been changed by electric um, company. I mean, uh, refrigerators or uh, microwaves or rice cookers, etc. Those kind of um, household um, household electric electricity. Those are main source of change of our habit. So we have to think about those kind of the, the role of technologies or the role of innovations and how we can invite investment of those um, technologies. Okay, thank you. Right. You gave us a very good uh, example. As far as I know, Japan introduced the top learner, top learner model for the electric company. Yes. If you have yes. a very low energy efficiency, the consumers association said, we are not gonna buy. So you just do it. So that's the things we have to pursue to change yes. uh, the habit. Because it's a long way, but uh, we do have a good, uh, some way and breakthrough on some examples. Anyway, as a moderator, I'm too talkative. I will <laughs> stop here and then I'm going to wrapping up uh, today's presentation and then uh, discuss them. Once again, thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, from the bottom of my heart for your valuable uh, presentation and uh, discussion. Innovation, change, mind change and habit change, and also uh, agricultural role as a diverse function.
which is a co-benefit and mitigation or adaptation and also sequestration and think is very important in agricultural sector as a whole. But if we do not have a specific target, specific technology, and willingness to achieve that target, that is just a dreaming. So we are going to face very hard, hard challenge in front. Carbon neutrality is not easy. We have to change everything. So let's keep that in mind. And then this is just the first step forward to the carbon neutrality. And then let's share our knowledge and our thinking from now on. Thank you very much for your good uh, presentation and the good valuable discussions. Thank you very much. I will stop here. Thank you. I Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, today's uh, thank you. Today's session has all ended. Uh, thank you very much for such wonderful presentations and the comments. And thank you all the uh, researchers, uh, participants, uh, speakers, and the panelists for being with us. Have you, uh, may you have a, a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.